we're good to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to our, this is the first in-person CHEP seminar since March of 2020, if you, can, if you can believe it. So thank you for your patience with our <laughs> technical uh, issues as we relearn how to use the equipment. It's amazing, it's amazing how quickly that human capital <laughs> depreciates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so th thanks for being here. Our, our speaker is Rachel Heath from the University of Washington. Uh, she's a labor and development economist who's published in, in leading journals in the field, the Journal of Political Economy, the Journal of the European Economic Association, Journal of Development Economics, and uh, her research expertise is in labor market opportunities for women in developing countries. And she's here today to pre present a new uh, working paper. Thanks so much for being here, Rachel. Great, thank you so much. Um, and let me just check, so I guess the norm is I'll take my mask off so you can hear me better. Okay, uh, that'll save you from my huffing and puffing too. Um, great, and I'm also vaccinated. Um, great, um, well thank you so much. Um, so this is obviously my first seminar um, in person for a while too, so um, it's just such a thrill to be back meeting people in person. Um, and uh, yeah, I've had really great conversations with all of you, so this, is, this has been wonderful. Uh, Great, awesome. Um, so yeah, so this is um, a paper um, that kind of comes out of my long running kind of series of papers on the, the garment industry um, in Bangladesh. Um, I've kind of had a chance to chat with several of you today about kind of you know, different parts of that research agenda. Um, this is a paper that kind of started after um, you know, the, you might remember from the news, there was a really tragic factory collapse in 2013. And so, you know, kind of a, a big policy interest in uh, working conditions and how those are determined, why were working conditions, you know, so bad such that, you know, in the extreme of, you know, a factory literally did collapse on itself. Um, and so um, this was kind of a project like investigating kind of, you know, the, the kind of source of some of that, um, you know, what, what might be leading to some of those, you know, very poor working conditions. Um, it's joint work with Laura Boudreau, who's now at Columbia Business School, and Tyler McCormick, who's at UW with, with me. Um, okay, so this is um, the, the collapse that I was telling you about. So this was Rana Plaza um, in April um, 2013. Um, and I just kind of show it, I mean, it's, it's a tragic picture, um, but I show it by kind of, to show you kind of, you know, extreme case of really bad working conditions in export manufacturing in low-income countries. So this picture, sometimes people think, you know, it looks like there was an earthquake, you know, there wasn't, it just collapsed onto itself. Um, you know, in retrospect, it turned, you know, it was kind of discovered, the building was, you know, not structurally sound, workers should never have been in it, it wasn't even zoned for, um, you know, for manufacturing in the first place. So, um, you know, just kind of several layers of things went wrong that led to this, you know, tragic, to this tragedy that led to, you know, over a thousand workers being killed, which made it the worst garment sec sector disaster ever. So people who went to school in the U.S. might remember the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, which is really important as far as kind of, you know, history of workers' rights in the U.S., but killed a little over a hundred people. So this is kind of, you know, an even bigger tragedy than that. Um, and, you know, just kind of the worst disaster in any industry in the world since 1984. So just kind of a really um, serious human scale. So, you know, aside from, you know, that kind of really striking example, you know, kind of by way of introduction, I want to make kind of a couple points on working conditions in export manufacturing in low-income countries. Uh, you know, the first is that they matter, and, you know, obviously when a factory falls down, that's kind of an extreme example. But, you know, even aside from those really extreme examples, um, there's documented kind of health consequences of working in factories. So, again, you know, kind of... Being killed is obviously a very extreme example of that, but there's also, you know, kind of repetitive industry, uh, injuries, uh, exposure to chemicals, et cetera. Um, and also just kind of reports of abuse and harassment that, you know, I think have serious welfare consequences for, for workers as well. The other thing is they kind of vary from workplace to workplace. So this is not something that kind of, um, you know, that's kind of maybe you know, uniform across every factory in an industry. Um, the kind of quote that I chose to illustrate this is um, at kind of a meeting in the immediate Rana Plaza. Um, aftermath, the US ambassador to Bangladesh kind of made the informal comment, you know, none of us here, you know, meeting in this room, kind of at the industry, or, you know, kind of, in a room and a meeting about improving conditions at the, in, the, in the industry, none of us know the owners of the factories that fell down. So kind of making the point that, you know, there were factory owners in that room. They were kind of the ones who, you know, working conditions aren't perfect, but, you know, kind of were much better than in the factories where in the extreme, you know, there was that collapse. 
And then the kind of the last point I want to make kind of qualitatively by way of introduction is that it's, you know, it's kind of qualitatively plausible that workers may not have full information about working conditions when they begin work. And that could be due to a combination of the fact that, you know, kind of factories claims aren't perfectly credible. So if they say, you know, come work at this factory, you know, we treat our workers well, that's, you know, kind of hard to, um, you know, hard to kind of, you know, fully, um, you know, believe um, as a worker coming in. And, you know, you might say, well, that's fine, but, you know, a robust word of mouth network between workers kind of substitutes for, you know, any sort of other information. Yeah, I think there's certainly a role for word of mouth, but, um, you know, in this paper, we're going to think that, you know, that's possibly not fully effective, especially in a world in which many of the workers are, um, you know, kind of new migrants from um, from rural areas. So that, you know, you've just come in and, you um, um, you know, and you kind of, you know, you don't know, um, you know, the set of factories you might work in and maybe you know a couple people, but they don't know those factories either. Uh, yes, Joe. So just a question, mm -hmm. it's just a sort of definitional kind of, I guess, question about working conditions and what, how, what we, sh the, the kinds of things we should be thinking about and what's been studied sort of in the prior literature. There's sort of physical safety, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the integrity of the, mm -hmm. of the building structure. There's, you know, stress in the environment or inappropriateness of interactions between colleagues. There's things like, you know, um, uh, amenities. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. place, how mm -hmm. nice the break room is. Yeah, and yeah. Your boss provides mm -hmm. snacks in the back of the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so how should we be thinking about what the literature has found in, in motivating the, 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 um, the kinds of working conditions you're going to be thinking about? Right, right. Yes. So, um, great question. So, we're. Um, I mean, we're going to kind of very much think of kind of a single index of working conditions so that they're, they're you know, certainly are, you know, and we kind of, you know, agree that all of those things you mentioned are, are salient. Uh, we're going to kind of empirically, we're going to kind of collapse, you know, kind of, you know, report, you know, things like, you know, um, is there sick leave um, with kind of, you know, reports of is the manager management abusive and kind of collapse that into a single index. Um, and so I think like, um, which, you know, is kind of potentially, you know, kind of collapsing interesting variation. Um, so, you know, um, like, we kind of haven't kind of, we haven't, you know, kind of in brainstorming, you know, with my co-authors, we haven't kind of come up with any examples where like there might be kind of, you know, reasons why firms would kind of invest in some conditions, working conditions, but not others. We're kind of thinking of all these things as, you know, somewhat hard to observe um, when, you, uh, when you start work. You might say, well, sick leave is, you know, a more kind of tangible thing, but if we're if we're thinking about things like you know, do you actually get to you know use the sick leave? It's not just something that's on the books. It's something that like when you ask your manager for leave, they you know won't fire you, and so that all these things are kind of hard to observe. Uh, but but so we're going to kind of collapse all that variation. But but it's true. There's kind of a lot of different dimensions to this. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, okay. So the key question we're going to ask in this paper is, you know, kind of given that we're arguing that, you know, working conditions vary from workplace to workplace, how do workers sort into these heterogeneous factories as far as working conditions? So more specifically, what we're going to do, so we're going to use data on the work history of about 1,000 garment workers that were collected in Bangladesh in 2009. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's a little while ago now. We're going to argue that this is kind of a really interesting time in the context of the growth of the garment industry as far as kind of, you know, when to think about working conditions. But so this is kind of, um, you know, looking at a pre Rana Plaza world where, you know, kind of, uh, you know, there wasn't as much international attention to working conditions, and I'll kind of get a little more into that. Um, so that's kind of the, the context, um, uh, or the, the time context of the, the data that we have. Um, and, you know, what's in our data? So we're going to use data on wages and working conditions. Um, and I'll kind of tell you more specifically, but just to give you a little preview, uh, so we're going to use kind of the workers' relationship with the management, um, any problems that they report, uh, and uh, a few kind of key non-wage benefits. So kind of, you know, it's kind of spanning, Joe, the, you know, the set of things you kind of mentioned. So we're going to kind of have, you know, kind of data on different kinds of working conditions. Um, we're going to document some key empirical differences between, um, you know, internal migrants and who we're calling locals. Uh, and those are workers who grew up in the districts near the factories. Uh, and those are that migrants are in factories with worse working conditions, but that actually, if anything, pay higher wages. 
Um, and so that's kind of, you know, an initial kind of sorting that workers are doing. Then, you know, kind of, you know, the second set of key facts is that they move towards condition, towards factories with better conditions as they gain experience in the industry. Yes. Does this data set have information on hours of work? So is it hourly wage that's higher? Yes, yes. Um, and that doesn't, so in practice, that doesn't vary much. So almost all workers report working um, 60 hours a week. So it's, it, no, it's a long work day. So a typical, worker would work six days a week for 10 hours a day. Um, and so like, there's not that much variation, but we actually are using hourly wage, so yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so you know, we'll kind of document those facts. And then we're gonna argue that's consistent with um, a theoretical model in which migrants are more likely to be uninformed uh, about working conditions uh, upon beginning work. So I've kind of worded this carefully. We're not gonna be able to fully rule out kind of other mo theoretical models that would explain these key facts. Um, we're, we'll give you kind of some qualitative evidence that suggests, you know, that kind of, you know, this fits with kind of, you know, qualitative anecdotes of, you know, kind of workers naivete upon beginning the, um, entering the industry. Uh, but, you know, we won't be able to kind of fully rule out other stories. Um, so one thing that we're really excited about is kind of um, a complementary paper that I'm doing um, in um, collaboration with Laura and then Narayan Das, who's um, at Brack University in Bangladesh, that's going to do an experimental test of this, this model. So to actually kind of experimentally provide information about working conditions and then kind of, you know, see, um, you know, are workers kind of um, acting as, you know, kind of as the model predicts and kind of, in you know, kind of, um, the same way that these kind of descriptive results um, uh, predict. So it's kind of, uh, it'll kind of be a more kind of, um, uh, what's the, the, you know, it'll be kind of a stricter test. Yeah. So feel free to punt on this till later at the mm -hmm. end for, for discussion, but what, are, are you also sort of randomizing the, 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 the types of sort of working condition information that you're providing to people across the kind of dimensions we've been talking about? Or? Yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, kind of the, the short answer is we can do whatever we want to because um, so we we've postponed field work hope, with the goal of hopefully kind of doing it in person um, and Bangladesh is kind of amidst a very big spike. Uh, so we, we certainly could do that if that was, um, you know, if kind of especially if, you know, pilot testing kind of suggested that there is kind of salient um, differences. Um, you know, again, we'd kind of thought of this kind of single index, um, but you know, that, that's, we're not wedded to that. Um, and we're also kind of, just to take a step back, we're kind of broadly trading off kind of um, interpretability. Um, so, you know, kind of if we do do a single index, the benefit of that is we'll say, here are the five best factories in your neighborhood. Um, you know, as far as, you know, working conditions as we measure it. Uh, but I mean, I don't think it's inconceivable that, you know, if we kind of had two key dimensions, we'd say, if you care about X, here's the first five factors, if you care about Y. And so I don't think we could do that with too much, but I think we could do it. And that could be really interesting, especially if kind of going back to your earlier point, Joe, if there's like, if there is kind of theoretical reason why firms might kind of make investments in different kinds of working conditions, then that would be kind of a really neat kind of addition to this model. Yeah. So do workers know that there's a lot of heterogeneity and they just don't know what factory is good and what's bad, or do they just not know what the distribution is of factory characteristics? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, so in kind of, um, piloting for this project that's kind of, that also, so the piloting for this project also kind of coincides with the, you know, kind of information gathering for the current project. So they kind of, since they fit. So workers certainly say stuff like, you know, uh, they call them compliant and non, because um, in a post Rana Plaza world, um, you know, there, there's kind of this, you know, it's not entirely binary. It's not like, you know, you either comply or you don't, but like, you know, there are these big, um, you know, international agreements about, you know, are you kind of agreeing to the following things that are supposed to happen? And so they do talk about, you know, are you working at a compliant factory versus, versus not? Um, and so I think, I think they're both aware that this variation exists. I mean, so I think they are the way this exists, exists but like. So they, they, know, they know that if they did search, they may find it. Uh, better opportunity, but they're migrants, so they don't have time. Or right. Yes. Exactly. You're kind of what you're. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, um, I totally agree. I mean, if it was costless to search, then this would be fine. They'd be like, oh, this stinks, but I'll just, you know, do a quick Google search and like, you know, move costlessly and immediately to the, um, you know, to a better factory. Um, so, so yes, exactly. So they, 
They're aware that this exists, but so basically, because most of the information is, you know, it's not in line to our knowledge. So if you want to, if, if you want another job, you have to go around in person to other factories and ask if they're hiring. And that's always at the beginning of the month. And so you've kind of signaled to your current factory that you're leaving. And so that kind of has a cost to you as far as, you know, foregone promotions there. So it's, I mean, they can do it, but it's a lost day of work and, you know, and there's that signaling cost. So, so, you know, it certainly happens because, you know, we see, you know, we see mobility, we see movement towards factories with better conditions, but like, you know, it's costly enough that it's not seamless. Yeah. So yeah. Quick question. When they move, do you know it's the same job or more like a different job? Yeah, so in the data, you know, we kind of have, so, so everybody's within the garment industry and there's kind of, you know, there's a certain kind of, um, you know, kind of regularity within the garment industry where, you know, kind of factories are pretty similar. Um, but we'd certainly know stuff like if they got a promotion um, and, you know, kind of other kind of, you know, some other characteristics of the, the job. So, so I'm thinking about two stories. One is migrants, right, could be a better or more abler. Uh huh. Uh huh. So there's a selection. Mm hmm. Choose to migrant at, at the beginning. Uh huh. Yeah, uh huh. The other story is when they got on the job, they got better on. So there's like some sort of on the job training. When they gain that, maybe human capital, or whatever, and then they choose to pick. Uh, right. Is better. Which ones? Right, right. And actually, we're going to, um, what we actually want to say is both, um, because to kind of fast forward a little bit, so like a strict version of the model that we're going to, the simple model we'll posit, we'll say that, you know, if it's all about working conditions, the migrants would be kind of getting better conditions, but actually worse wages as they go. But we're actually not finding that migrants are kind of having worse wages as they go. So if you believe the kind of, you know, that model of kind of migrants moving towards better conditions, but there's some trade off at the margin between wages and working conditions, you need some countervailing force. And I think learning by doing those kind of things are exactly the kind of thing we, we need. So, uh, so what we want to argue is that both are going on. They're kind of, you know, they are kind of gaining experience and, you know, at a faster rate than locals. And that's part of the rationale for moving, but looking for better conditions is as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that migrants are paid more than locals, they have higher wages but work in worse conditions. Why is it that migrants are paid higher wages than the locals? Right, and so and so the the key thing is that that's at the factory level. So it's within factory, they're not higher paid, but they're at the kinds of factories that pay higher wages. And so uh, our story is exactly it's nothing about the migrants per se. It's that some factories are making investments in working conditions that are costly, and um, and you know so then you know they you know so then they you know do pay less wages. Other factories are you know not investing in working conditions and so pay more. Um, and so, so that's the, the that's the story. It's not a within factory story. Yeah. Uh, great. Okay. So just to briefly situate this within the literature on workers and firms in, in developing countries, and in particular, kind of in export manufacturing. Um, so you know, kind of, we're not the first that have kind of you know argued that there is this between factory heterogeneity. Um, so you know, other papers have pointed out things that, like you know that factories vary in terms of things like managerial capacity or access to credit, which would allow them uh, differential access or you know differential investment in. Um, into capital and, you know, might change the whole production process. So, you know, kind of there is this underlying heterogeneity that other papers have documented. Um, so, you know, kind of, again, kind of focusing on a similar question to what we're looking at, um, you know, given this heterogeneity, how, you know, how does it play out that some workers, you know, work in some kinds of factories and other workers in other kinds of factories? So the literature's kind of, you know, proposed a variety of explanation, ranging from things that are kind of, you know, roughly efficient. So take skill complementarity, for instance, you know, so uh, workers that, you know, if there's a higher marginal product of higher skilled workers in a factory with better managerial capacity or more capital, then, you know, an efficient market's gonna sort higher ability workers into those factories. So that's kind of roughly, you know, an efficient world. There's other things that are kind of less efficient in the sense that, you know, there might be a role for, for nepotism. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of there's rents to certain kinds of jobs and managers find a way to, uh, um, to get, you know, kind of workers into those, um, you know, workers that they favor into those jobs. 
or just search frictions, which you know we'll have a role for too. Yes. Does any of these categories capture amenities that you know, like the standard theory in labor economics of why wages are higher in certain uh, plants or uh, professions because they're more dangerous, or they, you know, there's a. It doesn't that belong in that category? Some differences in amenities in how, in you know, how dangerous the place is. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so the the closest paper that I know that kind of looks at say amenities. Um, is at the industry level. Um, and so it looks at kind of migrants' decisions um, of what kind of industry to work in after migrating. Um, and so it's true we could kind of we could kind of cite that broadly as far as you know kind of um, you know uh, value of uh, value of a statistical life type model uh, compensating differentials. It's, um, it's, but it's applicable here because certain uh, managers or owners may not have pro you know provided the, the security that their buildings may not be as that stable etc right 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 um so yeah and i think you know that's kind of um you know um and we kind of you know indeed you know in as much as that literature points out that you know kind of there are other salient differences we you know kind of fully embrace that literature and we're going to kind of add on to it you know is there a role for imperfect information in that world so i think you know uh we're you know it's not at all kind of you know contradictory to our, our results. Um, so you see, yeah, kind of um, a role for working conditions or amenities could certainly be a bullet point here too. Um, uh, you know, so, so the maybe kind of perhaps closest um, strain of the literature to our, um, uh, to, you know, to this paper is uh, a set of papers, including um, a paper that I wrote on referrals that kind of argues that there's a role for information problems in kind of the matching of workers to firms. But all of these papers are focused on, um, on the kind of firms having imperfect information about workers. And obviously, since I've written in this literature, I'm not at all kind of denying that that's important. But what we're going to add in, um, in this paper is, is there a role for the workers' information set? And Shoshana, going back to your question, you know, if amenities, you know, and I, I agree, amenities are part of, the, uh, part of the sorting. And so the question is kind of, is it, you know, kind of workers don't have full information about those amenities when they're choosing where to work? Um, and so the last kind of strand of the literature that I want to relate this to is kind of more specifically on labor and manufacturing industries. Um, so, you know, there's been kind of a focus on wages, which are obviously an important, um, you know, outcome for, you know, given that workers are, are poor. Um, looking at things like, you know, is there an export wage premium? Um, do um, uh, the Harrison and Scores paper, you know, kind of looks at does kind of international anti-sweatshop pressure raise wages. So those are important uh, outcomes um, in and of themselves. So in as much as kind of there's a role for looking at working conditions, they're typically measured at the industry level. So Shoshana, this is the paper that I was telling you about that kind of uh, points out, you know, kind of what's the role of kind of working conditions um, in, um, you know, kind of workers um, choosing where to work. Um, and so, you know, again, we're kind of, you know, we're totally embracing the fact that from industry to industry, there's variation in working conditions. We're going to add, we think within industry, there's also variation from workplace to workplace in working conditions. Um, an important exception um, uh, is Marie Tanaka's paper, uh, which has now been published, I need to update that, um, where she looks at um, kind of how Myan firms in Myanmar are beginning to export affects working conditions. So a different topic than ours, but this is kind of one of the rare papers that has uh, data within an industry on how working conditions vary from workplace to workplace. Um, so um, a paper in the US and that, you know, kind of in the low income world. A recent paper on the US finds that firm level variation in working conditions is um, important in the US, so kind of significant enough to kind of explain the overall wage distribution. We'd argue that's possibly even more so in developing countries for some of the reasons I've talked about that, you know, there might not be full information uh, of workers. So, you know, maybe kind of imperfect information further spreads out working conditions. There's less of a role for kind of government regulations to kind of, you know, put a minimum on kind of how bad can working conditions get so that, you know, possibly the role of 
within, you know, within industry, between firm variation and working conditions is even more important in, in developing countries. Is garment industry and energy different uh, from the other, uh, say, toy luggages, other apparel in manufacturing? Yeah, uh, I, I um, you know, kind of with the caveat, I haven't studied any of those industries. I'd suspect it's broadly similar. So that, you know, the things that we kind of emphasize about the garment industry, you know, there's lots of kind of naive workers kind of flowing in from rural areas like that. You know, I suspect characterizes those industries as well. And you know, the uh, and you know, because another important point is that you know, garment production is not kind of a fundamentally dangerous thing. Um, you know, there, there's, I mean, you know, repetitive stress injuries, et cetera, are important as well. But that, you know, it's not that we're kind of studying a fundamentally dangerous industry. It's, you know, an industry that needs to take place in buildings that might not be safe themselves. So, uh, so yeah, I think there's kind of a wide, right, you know, a wide kind of application to kind of other manufacturing for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I'm going to start with the empirical results in this uh, paper. So what I'll do is first tell you about kind of the data and the setting that we um, collected um, the data in and kind of then tell you those results and then kind of at the end sketch a um, theoretical model that um, kind of explains those, those results. So um, that's kind of the order that we'll go. Um, so I kind of mentioned um, earlier that I think the garment industry in 2009 was um, kind of a unique time to study the garment industry. Um, so, um, so let me just kind of spend a couple minutes telling you about that. So 2009 is kind of right at the peak of this very fast, um, fast growth. Um, so, you know, kind of what's the role of, you know, I've talked about firm to firm variation in working conditions. What's the role of kind of firm to firm d um, variation in the wages that they pay? So the minimum wage was um, 1,662.5 taka per month. Um, that was um, about $30 US. Um, the key thing is that that was binding, um, you know, there was kind of a lump in the histogram um, at that amount, but some firms paid more. So the key thing here is I don't want you to think of a world in which there's a minimum wage that's high enough and binding that, you know, all firms just pay that minimum. There is kind of, you know, some firms were paying, um, you know, were paying considerably more. Um, there was less international attention to working conditions. So uh, when we sketch out a theoretical model, we're going to kind of think about firms kind of deciding, you know, are they competing for workers that are informed about working conditions versus not? So there's not, in the model we posit, there's not a role for, um, you know, an international community saying, like, you need to improve working conditions. That's obviously a simplification. You know, there had been smaller tragedies before Rana Plaza, so it's not that, you know, everybody thought that working conditions were totally safe and perfect, but compared to a post-Rana Plaza world, there's much less, so there weren't big international agreements to improve things. Um, so I have a paper that's quite complementary, which is, you know, so then Rana Plaza happened, there were kind of big changes in the kind of international environment, and so in that paper, we're looking at, you know, kind of what, ha what was the result of those Rana Plaza reforms. So uh, we think of that paper as quite complementary, um, but, you know, in this paper, everything's pre-Rana Plaza. As I mentioned, we're kind of thinking it as a way to kind of, how can we understand, how do working conditions get so bad such that Rana Plaza happened? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, um, yeah, it's a good question. I need to update this because they've released the BGMEA, the Export Manufacturers Association has released a couple more workers. They, I mean, I think there's some degree of estimation in this, so I don't know if it's kind of literally been, been flat, but it kind of started to grow again. So I don't think you want to think about it as like kind of, you know, it's totally flattened out, but that, you know, maybe there was kind of a bit of a plateau or maybe it just was slow to update. Yeah. yeah. What was the general age of the workers uh, in the garment factories? Yeah, um, let me see if I can, I'm going to guess, and then we'll, when we get to my table of summary statistics, we'll test my memory. Uh, I mean, so, so they're, they're young. Um, average age should be something like 25. Um, so, in a, you know, in a kind of, so a typical worker's career would be that they would work, you know, some would leave right away, and we'll talk about kind of selection out of the sample, but, um, you know, a typical worker would at least plan to, you know, maybe work for, five, ten years, and then kind of go back home to a rural area. Uh, okay. 
Uh, okay. Uh, and so I think, you know, kind of one of the other reasons we think this is kind of an interesting setting, 2009, is that this kind of, you know, the context we're studying, you know, a really rapid um, period of employment growth. Um, so the, the period of this graph, um, this averages out to like 17% yearly employment growth. So just really rapid growth, you know, migrants flowing in from rural areas is, you know, kind of, I think, applies to a lot of other kind of, you know, young industries in low income countries. Okay. Um, so the data for this project, so the important thing is, you know, the first important thing to point out is a household survey. So uh, you would be rightful, to, you know, you'd be rightfully skeptical if we kind of got data on working conditions as reported by the firms. Um, so, but this is workers in their, um, their households. That doesn't mean we're going to kind of ignore potential for, you know, underreporting of bad conditions or measurement error. But I think, you know, I think the best case of getting accurate information is, um, you know, is from a household survey like we did. Um, so there are 44 villages and they're kind of graphed right here. And so here's DACA. And so they're all very close to DACA, but they're not in DACA itself. Um, and the reason why that's key is that um, in DACA, some of the factories have dormitories. And so you might be worried that a household survey, they wouldn't let you into the dormitory. And so you'd get kind of a strange selection of, you know, workers not in dormitories or that whose dormitories let you talk to them. But we kind of went far enough out to find factories where dormitories aren't important. So what we have here is, you know, a representative, we're, we're quite confident this is a representative sample of residential garment workers in these areas, um, which, have, you know, which, you know, of course, could be a little bit different than those in DOC itself. But, you know, we're not worried in this context about, you know, missing some workers, you know, uh, in these villages. Sorry. Yeah. This is where they live or where they work? Or is this where their households are or where the factories are? Yeah, good question. So this is where they live. So, you know, kind of for a chosen village, we did a census, uh, figured out where the garment workers live, oversampled garment workers. So, um, so yes, yeah, so these, these are villages, not factories. Yeah. And the factories will be pretty close by. We didn't kind of restrict it to workers, you know, living close by, but, you know, kind of picture, you know, kind of a small circle around each, each village. Um, Great. Okay. Um, so um, I already kind of talked about, you know, that dormitories aren't um, kind of big in these areas. Um, a couple other things about, you know, the context that are important for interpretation. Uh, so the, these areas um, had kind of more woven factories than in the rest of the industry. And that, um, you know, kind of so woven factories kind of have, you know, big looms. Um, and the reason why that's important is that, um, you know, that kind of the workers that are operating the looms um, tend to be more likely to be men. Uh, so when you see the sample, we're actually at about almost 50-50 of a gender split, which we kind of think is an advantage. We don't find a big role for gender, but it's not we think it's not because we don't have enough men in the sample. Um, you know, nationwide, the estimates are, depending on how you define a garment worker, uh, 70 to 80 percent um, women, so that, you know, we kind of have a more balanced gender um, split than, you know, the industry overall. Um, the other thing, so as I mentioned, you, we kind of intentionally went outside Dhaka City to these kind of villages surrounding Dhaka. So then you might kind of have in your head, okay, well, you went to a, you know, a more rural village. Um, but I don't want you to have a picture in your head where, you know, we kind of went to, you know, a rural village and there's one factory to work in and it's that factory or nothing as far as, you know, garment work. Because, you know, we're going to kind of posit a role of workers kind of shopping around um, um, four different factories. As I told, you know, Jacob earlier, you know, that process isn't costless, at least we'll argue that. But, you know, it certainly happens. Um, you know, and the kind of, you know, the fact that we actually do see turnover um, argues against, you know, world of complete monopsony power where it's, you know, this factory or nothing. So the, the average worker surveyed in 2009 over the course of their career, which is about, on average, about four or five years, they've worked in 2.3 factories. So, you know, they don't move from, you know, every month, but, you know, they certainly, you know, do move factories. Okay. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the survey structure, um, how it generated the information we'll use. Um, so as I mentioned, it took place over a couple months in 2009. So we get the wage and factory history of about a thousand garment workers. Um, so what does that mean? 
So if you're a current garment worker, we said, OK, great. You know, tell us a little bit about your current factory. And then we said we embarked upon a painstaking module where we um, said, OK, now tell us when you started work in the garment industry. Tell us about that factory. What wage did you make when you started that factory? You know, did you get any raises? You know, when did you get those ra th that raise, et cetera? And then we kind of did that all the way up to the present. So what that means is that you know, we have every monthly wage and kind of factory level information on every factory since they begin work. Um, so you know, another way to say this is it's a retrospective panel. So you know, for current workers, we trace them back in history. Um, but you know, obviously, you know, kind of a, a challenge there is that we don't see workers who you know, started work several years ago, hated it, and went back home. Um, so that's kind of, um, you know, that, that's kind of um, you know, certainly in an ideal world, we'd, we'd have those workers in the data. To kind of mitigate those concerns, um, uh, we're going to do kind of within-person empirical tests wherever possible. So, uh, you know, with kind of worker fixed effects, we'll be looking at, you know, kind of how the careers of migrants versus workers, or migrants versus locals evolve. Um, and so, you know, that kind of avoids kind of a a cohort, you know, kind of a changing, you know, kind of comparison of a cohort over, or composition, I mean, of a cohort over time. Um, but it still affects the interpretation of who we're doing those tests on. So, you know, when we kind of show you results, just kind of keep in mind, we're saying how have kind of the careers of migrants that haven't left the industry evolved compared to locals who haven't left the industry. Um, and so, um, so information on working conditions, we're going to view that as kind of a factory level outcome. So um, I'll, I'll tell you in just a slide or two what those you know, specific measures are. But so for each factory, we've said, OK, great, you moved to a new factory. Now tell us, you know, was the management there abusive? You know, did they give you sick leave, um, et cetera? Um, so it would go factory by factory. And again, we have that at their current and their past uh, factories. And that was kind of as reported by the respondent. So the factories kind of don't have any role of giving us this information. OK, uh, Okay. so here's the table of summary statistics where we can kind of test my memory on how I you know, kind of remembered about some of these, uh, these outcomes. Um, so a couple key summary statistics. And I'm also kind of in this table introducing the, dis the key empirical distinction we're going to use. Um, of migrants versus locals. Um, we're going to define a migrant based on where you're born. Um, and so, you know, a migrant is a respondent who was not born in Dhaka or Ghazipur districts, which are the two districts that contain the areas we, we surveyed. Um, so that's obviously, you know, throwing away some potential variation that we could use because, um, you know, some of the migrants kind of moved to. Um, um, you know, to these areas, you know, kind of before they started working in the, uh, in the garment industry, you might think that they look more like locals. Um, in the paper, we kind of, you know, show that we can kind of use those definitions um, uh, and kind of get similar results. We like this kind of, you know, kind of strict definition based on where you're born, because in your, in your work history, sometimes workers were kind of in different places where they started to work. And so we don't know if you were kind of considered a migrant or a local vis-a-vis -vis that. <laughs> Um, that location, if that makes sense. Um, um, but, you know, our, our results don't kind of hinge upon this specific uh, definition of migrants versus locals. Yeah. yeah. I, I note that the married migrants, male married migrants especially, were much more likely to be married. And so I wonder if they're, to what degree their choice of uh, employers that pay more uh, were, was related to their marital status. Do, do you control for that in those regressions? Is it, if, we, if we ever get to the um, well, I mean, I would say that's not a super big, you know, so 81% versus 76%. No, no, yeah. comparing the locals versus the migrants. Oh, I see, compared so to, yeah, yeah. versus 0.8. Yeah. Uh, so, so it could possibly explain why the, the migrants were getting paid more. Um. Right. Uh, yeah. No. So I mean, I think. Um, I mean, so our kind of empirical, broadly our empirical um, approach in this paper is to, uh, you know, kind of be relatively parsimonious in controls and just kind of document this set of, um, of you know, empirical, um, 
facts and then kind of say what models can explain it. So I think, you know, I think in the end, I mean, you know, we could kind of empirically control for, you know, say marital status and see if that explains the migration results. Um, but I think, you know, you know, what I would do is kind of say, you know, if it's kind of, if it is just, you know, a story of marriage, I mean, I think that's going to kind of fold into the um, explanation that we have that, you know, maybe they just have a higher marginal utility of income, you know, they have families to support. Um, and so I think, you know, that can kind of certainly explain why they would kind of have a preference for higher wages. It, you know, kind of the question would be kind of, would that fade with time? And so, you know, given that at the time of the survey, there's still these differences, it suggests that, you know, that's more of kind of a time invariant preference. If they're kind of throughout their careers, they're more likely to be married and have families. Um, but, um, but I think that's the, I mean, we certainly, you know, among other things, we have, you know, other reasons to believe migrants would have a higher marginal utility of income. So I think that kind of folds into that story that we'll, we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, is there any, like, government level policy difference between yeah, there's not really, I mean, because the government is pretty hands off, so that kind of officially, you know, everybody's kind of legally allowed to be here, so there isn't really a role for the government treating you differently. Yeah. Good question. Um, great. Well, I think you all have kind of, you know, highlighted a couple of the key distinctions. I mean, so, you know, we certainly don't want to argue that migrants and locals are, you know, identical. Um, so, you know, Shoshana pr pr pointed out differences in, you know, marriage rates. Um, the locals um, have, you know, kind of slightly more experience than the migrants. Um, uh, kind of roughly similar education. Um, so, but, you know, they're kind of not huge differences either. Um, you know, they're kind of broadly comparable, we'll argue. Um, okay. okay, so let me tell you a bit more um, before kind of showing you empirical results, let me just tell you a bit more on how we measure working conditions. Um, so, you know, I've kind of broadly talked about these, but now to give you kind of the specific measures. So uh, we used workers' reports of their relationship with management. That was kind of on a five-part point Likert scale. So, you know, excellent ranging down to very bad. Um, the kind of the non-wage benefits, so whether the factory provides um, medical care, um, whether the factory provides an appointment letter, which is kind of like a contract. Um, they're supposed to all do this, but in practice not all do. That gives you some measure of job security. Um, and then we kind of had an open-ended question where we just said, were there any problems in this factory? And these kind of, then we went back and coded them, and these were the ones that kind of came, um, came up. Um, so, um, we're going to combine these into a factory level index. Um, we use principal components. It's kind of not, you know, we can do other things that kind of give a similar measure. And the key thing is we're going to average this at the factory level. So we're thinking about kind of working conditions as, you know, kind of something that the factory offers to, you know, kind of all the workers, you know, it's the same kind of investment. Yes. So for the abuse of management statistic, was that, uh, did you know, was there a uh, noticing it Emotional abuse, physical abuse, or one or the other? Um, so um, we just said, you know, th this was kind of how was the relationship with the management? Oh, and they, you know, so abusive management was just kind of a, you know, a combination of, this is not like natural language processing or anything, we just kind of had an already go back and kind of group them. So, I mean, uh, we could we could go back to the original Bangla and see if they mentioned it or if they just said abuse. Um, from other data that I've had, like yelling and emotional abuse is much more common than physical abuse. Um, and then kind of sexual abuse amongst women in particular is kind of in the middle. Um, so, so I think uh, from labor force survey data, something like 12% of garment workers report emotional abuse. Um, um, about 5% of women workers and very little men report sexual abuse and physical abuse is only about 1%. So I mean, kind of that, that can be your prior on this, but we didn't differentiate. A question on the you said, so you mentioned it that in practice all the firms are supposed to offer these appointment letters. What are the what are the what are the sorry I don't know the institutional sort of details in, 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 in government policies in Bangladesh about the provision of medical care and what type of medical care and what's required and what's not and what's elective. Right, right. Um, so um, medical care at the time was not required. Some factories did, did choose to do it so that this one wasn't required. Yeah. Um, 
And I'm trying to think if there are any other salient kind of requirements. And so yeah, I mean, so some factories did, um, so like, so, you know, for instance, unpaid overtime, they're you know, supposed to pay workers for overtime. So some of these do kind of um, represent kind of, you know, violations vis-a-vis -vis what's supposed to be, you know, happening. And others of them, you know, are kind of above and beyond, you know, like, so say medical care. So it's kind of a combination of violating laws or just kind of going above and beyond. Great. Um, let me just briefly tell you kind of some summary statistics on the working conditions. And I think overall, you know, kind of because, you know, garment factories are often hard places to work. Um, you know, so workers are pretty stoic in the sense that, you know, I think they, you know, it took a pretty extreme problem for, for them to report it. Um, the way we're interpreting this is that, you know, kind of workers kind of internalized that, you know, conditions are often pretty tough. And so that, you know, these are kind of extreme cases vis-a-vis, um, you know, kind of their benchmark that, you know, at the time of the survey, they'd been in the industry for, you know, on average four or five years. And so they were kind of telling us about, but they're certainly kind of, you know, you could also kind of be worried about underreporting here. Um, so, um, so yeah, and kind of, you know, um, in the, you know, kind of, uh, only 15% of workers said that, you know, relations with management were excellent, but, you know, kind of most said good. Um, so that again, you know, they're pretty, you know, stoic because, um, you know, I've seen factories that, you know, there's some yelling going on. Um, and, um, you know, as far as appointment letters, I mentioned they're supposed to, but only in practice, only 38% of factories um, are um, giving them and 70% provide some medical care. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we do have that some, yeah, because, you know, since it was all specified and then went back, it's just that kind of, these were the ones that we couldn't code. So yeah, th those kind of exist in Bangla somewhere. If you look within the same factory, um, is the reporting of some of these more subjective measures and difference between the migrants and the local? Yeah, yeah, so we, um, we did exactly that test and kind of looked within factory. Um, and there's, there's a tiny, they're not tiny. I mean, uh, I think I actually have that um, table and I can show you. So there is a sense that within factory migrants report worse conditions, but it's a lesser amount than the kind of between factory that, you know, that we find. So I think we're kind of saying that the, the more salient variation is factory to factory. And I think I'll be able to show you that. Yeah, it's a great question. Like differences in perception versus actual differences in treatment? Like you think that, is there any anecdotal evidence that migrants actually get worse? Yeah, I mean, I think like, so, and that's kind of driven to some extent that, um, you know, they are less likely to say receive an appointment letter. So in as much as, um, um, you know, uh, the story about, you know, kind of migrants, like, you know, kind of becoming, you know, more skilled as they go, you know, if a factory is giving appointment letters to some workers and not others, you know, it might be exactly those migrants kind of at the beginning of their career that the firms aren't bothering with. So that, uh, that, that is driving some of the within factory difference. The other thing we can do is kind of it, to kind of you know to kind of alleviate some of these concerns about reporting bias. We can um, construct a measure of factory conditions that doesn't include the workers' own reports. So say kind of you know factory conditions as reported by other workers and kind of the same patterns we document kind of go through. So that kind of you know does kind of alleviate. It's not all just the workers' own perception. Okay. Um, so this is just the distribution of working conditions. Um, there's a long left tail. It looks similar whether we weight by the number of worker month observations or not. Um, and that's, you know, because factories that have one problem tend to have a bunch and also because, you know, working conditions are top coded in the sense that, you know, a lack of problems. So, you know, there's kind of some lumping near the top where, you know, they didn't have many problems. Uh, but, you know, we do get this variation that is kind of gives us the empirical variation we use. Um, okay, so now we'll kind of tell you the empirical results um, that I've been kind of foreshadowing, but I'll show you kind of more in detail how we get them. Um, so the first is that migrants are in factories with worse conditions than locals. Um, so here in this table, the dependent variable is the factory level index of working conditions. Um, and we start by, because um, if you remember, we have the factory level conditions for each month um, that the worker has, um, you know, has worked in the industry. Um, so we start by kind of having the level of observation be a worker month observation. Um, and so over the course of the entire career in a given month, a migrant has, um, and we standardize the working conditions measure. So 
a uh, migrant has 0.3 standard deviations worse, faces 0.3 standard deviations worse of working conditions compared to locals. Um, that isn't explained by, um, and Shoshana, we could certainly add marriage to this and just kind of, you know, as kind of a uh, first pass through to kind of just to show you it's not explained by kind of, you know, the kind of rough observables between migrants and locals. Um, what is really surprising to me is that there is no gender factor. And men and women, are, once you control for the education experience, etc., they're on the same. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, and um, and I can check, I can't remember if I, sh I showed it in the table. I mean, you might think that within factory there's some role for, you know, differences men versus women, but I agree. Our, our prior was, um, you know, maybe that there is a role for gender and, you know, obviously I've done a lot of work in gender, but this kind of isn't the most salient fact of this paper and I agree that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so then, uh, we, we then do, for the rest of this table, we just use current observations so that, um, you know, kind of alleviate some of these concerns about, you know, kind of using that retrospective data with kind of um, selective attrition. It also lets us use village fixed effects because we know their current village, we don't always know their past village. So if we use just current observations, the difference between migrants and locals fades, which, you know, if you believe our story, it should, because, you know, if they're moving towards better conditions, you know, that difference will fade with experience, but it doesn't go away totally. So at the time of the survey, um, about 0.19 um, standard deviation difference between migrants and locals. And then in the last two columns, I guess this is cut off a little bit, but it doesn't change much. Um, the, when we put factory fix, or when we put village fixed effects, the coefficient's about the same. Um, and so it's not just a story where migrants are in different kinds of places than locals, and those places, for whatever reason, have worse working conditions. So it's, you know, if you compare the R square from the regression without village fixed effects and with the village fixed effects, it appears that these village, there's a very important variation by village. So what is it about the villages that have better work conditions? Well, are they closer to the government? Are they being supervised more? What's yeah, the that's a good question. We can look at that. I mean, and I think to some extent this might be kind of just random in the sense that, you know, there's kind of 44 fixed effects and so, you know, some of it might just be coincidence, but if my hunch is that that R squared is more than would just be at random. Um, so yeah, let me investigate that. I bet probably closer to DACA does matter. Um, but yeah, that, that is kind of, you know, given that it's a paper about factory level variation, um, yeah, it would be kind of interesting to kind of say between village to go back to that for sure, yeah. So kind of related to that, how much variation in competition is there within village? Are there some villages with a lot of factories where maybe transaction costs are low for workers? And if I was a migrant, you know, maybe I moved to a place where there are a lot of factories close together because I know there is this heterogeneity in uh, working conditions that I want to be able to maybe more easily leave my job if there, there is an issue. So you're saying kind of village to village variation in like in this heterogeneity. In transaction costs and in competition that's maybe related to one another. Right, right, it's a good question. I mean, so they're all kind of, I mean, as I mentioned to Shoshana, I mean, some of them are closer to DACA than others. I mean, they're kind of still broadly similar. I mean, and I kind of don't know of different like institutions say, you know, some villages, you know, have kind of, you know, a big bulletin board with, you know, kind of postings or anything. So I mean, I think kind of, certainly in kind of traveling around these villages as a survey, I didn't kind of see obvious, differences that might lead to that, but, uh, but I don't want to rule that out entirely. It just kind of didn't pop out as salient qualitatively. Yeah. Um, great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, oh, so, so here is um, the, the, um, the, 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 um, um, uh, here's the chart that I mentioned on, you know, kind of, that was a, that was a, the last, the last slide was a, you know, kind of factory to factory variation in working conditions. This is within factory. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, so the coefficient on migrant, I mean, it's not zero. Um, and so, you know, 0.1 standard deviation is not a trivial difference, but it's kind of, it's, it's, you know, it's a much lower than the 0.3 standard deviation difference and kind of between factory conditions they're facing. Um, so Shoshana, there is kind of a role um, when we, uh, uh, when we kind of use the past observations, but not the village fixed effects. And I guess similarly, uh, you know, with the village fixed effects. So, you know, 
there, I think there is a rule that males are kind of, um, you know, facing somewhat better conditions. But again, you know, the most salient story here is the, you know, the migrants um, and the between factory variation. Um, so, you know, kind of, you know, there's some interesting stuff going on in this table too, but nothing's kind of the same order of magnitude as the, you know, the migrants and the between factory variation. Um, I, ha I kind of, um, I already mentioned, you know, we can kind of leave out the worker's own report and kind of a very similar result. We can also leave out reports from current factories if you're worried that, you know, kind of they might be particularly worried about telling us about bad conditions in their current factory, if they're worried about retribution, things like that. We can kind of throw out those reports and kind of get a similar uh, pattern here. Um, and um, we can kind of show that it's not, it doesn't look like a story of any one working conditions matters. This is not all driven by appointment letters or anything like that. It kind of, you know, gets quite noisy, but, you know, it kind of looks broadly that, you know, the kind of same pattern applies to, you know, all the different working conditions measures. Okay. So the second key empirical fact that we find are that migrants are in factories that pay higher wages. Um, and, you know, I want to be kind of upfront, you know, this is not the kind of most you know statistically significant striking result but i think we kind of broadly i'll tell you why we broadly interpret it as migrants are in factories with higher wages so what we do is so the dependent variable is log wage um is, to go back to shoshana's question is hourly wage i should have added that but it is hourly wage um and so we include we do that both in an ols framework and with factory fixed effects um and so um migrants are earning you know so the outcomes log wage, so, you know, kind of uh, pooled across all their careers, they earn about 5% more than, um, um, than locals. Uh, I put male in education, I couldn't fit experience, uh, quadratic and experience, but that's in there. So kind of, they're earning about 5% more, you know, conditional on those kind of basic demographic variables. But we put in factory fixed effects that, um, uh, you know, that 5% more, which, you know, is not statistically different from zero itself. But those are kind of um, statistically different from zero um, at the 10% level from each other. Um, so we're going to kind of interpret this as migrants are in factories that pay higher wages because putting in factory fixed effects significantly changes the coefficient on migrants compared to locals. Uh, it's even stronger when we only use current factories. Um, you know, so kind of using only the current data, migrants earn 8% more than locals. You know, a pretty big effect, given that we've kind of conditioned out, uh, you know, kind of some key demographics. Um, but when we put in factory fixed effects, if anything, they're earning less than other workers in their same factories. Um, and um, the P is um, um, cut off by the Zoom, but is kind of now highly significant. Um, so I've kind of showed you, or yeah. So in that past table, are you the, the, the difference between the OLS and the fixed effects? Uh, and so it, it does seem like there's a difference in that from the, uh, from the factories, and so we attribute that to the factory level versus not. When we see the difference in the education, how do we think about that in terms of, is it, um, does this tell us something about who is selecting into particular factories, the fact that that is different as well. That's right, and it, yeah, That's yeah, the yeah. That right, right, it's a good point, right, so that some of the education um, premium is also kind of explained by factory fixed effects, and so that kind of is consistent with, you know, kind of some of the sorting that I kind of told you about going on in the background, that, you know, factories that pay higher wages anyway might attract higher workers. Um, so, so, yeah, that's a good point, that that's kind of going on in the background of this. I mean, at least it appears. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Um, um, so I've showed you data on wages, factory-level wages and factory-level working conditions. An obvious question would be, how do those co-vary? Um, and the answer is kind of roughly an R squared of, of zero. It's pretty small here, but these are very small correlations and not statistically significant. Um, so, you know, how do you interpret that? So, you know, a standard compensating differentials model, uh, whether or not there's full information, would say these things negatively co-vary. And so, um, you know, why isn't that, ha you know, I think compensating differentials are real. Why is that not happening? It looks like, you know, so model of a vertical hierarchy of firms, so kind of, you know, a sorting model like we were just talking about, 
would suggest you know, a positive correlation that you know firms that kind of give higher compensation would you know kind of give higher wages and have better conditions. So that would make these things positively covary. So at least kind of one potential explanation for this is that you know those things are going on at the same time, roughly the same magnitude. Okay. Um, so the third key empirical fact um, is that migrants are in high mobility factories, so the kinds of factories that workers want to leave. Um, so the dependent variable in this table is a one if you switch factories in a given month conditional on staying in the industry. Because remember, if you leave to go home, you drop out of the data. But we know if workers kind of switch from a factory to a factory. Um, so. Um, um, and so, and these are, um, it's a low jit since, you know, the um, dependent variable here is about 3% um, of workers in a given month switch factories. Um, so, so it's a low jit uh, given that, you know, that's a pretty small outcome. Uh, and these are all marginal effects. So a migrant in any given month is 1.37 percentage points more likely than a local to switch factories. So that is quite big compared to the mean dependent variable that didn't fit on the table, but is about 3%. Um, and so, um, uh, and again, that's kind of, you know, there's other kind of patterns going on in the data too. Men are more likely to switch factories than women, um, educated workers as well. But, um, you know, kind of, these are all kind of a smaller coefficient, um, you know, the kind of most um, significant, or the most kind of, um, you know, largest in magnitude coefficient in this table is uh, the migrant variable. Then we put in factory fixed effects. Um, and the migrant coefficient drops. Um, I don't want to say that's zero because it drops in about half. Um, and you know, in the last table, I was kind of you know interpreting results that were not quite statistically significant but qualitatively important. So I don't want to say that factory fixed effects explain the entire migrant um, coefficient, but it kind of drops it. So at least some of the um, tendency for migrants to be more likely to move than locals is that they're in the kinds of factories that people want to leave. Um, okay, our last key empirical fact, um, and then I'll just, um, you know, I know we don't have much time, but I just kind of gave a sketch of the model, so it's not, it's not a full model anyway, so we have, we have time. Um, so the last key empirical fact is that um, migrants improve their conditions with experience. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we can do this test within person, so we're going to do it, so individual fixed effects, so you're kind of comparing the trajectories um, of migrants versus locals. Um, and um, so migrants um, improve their working conditions by about 0.03 standard deviations um, for each year that they work compared to locals. Um, so, you know, it would take a 10 year career to kind of um, explain on average that, you know, 0.3 standard deviation difference. Um, so, you know, and again, you know, indeed that kind of fits with the, um, you know, the kind of differences when using the current data in migrants versus locals. So it doesn't go away totally, but it kind of starts to fade with. Uh, with time. Um, as I mentioned, um, you might kind of wonder, well, so what's going on with their wages uh, with experience? And um, the migrants don't have a differential um, trend with experience compared to, um, compared to locals. Okay. Um, so um, I promise not to kind of do a full model in the last five minutes only, but I'll just kind of sketch out kind of how we're thinking about a model that um, can explain those results. Um, so if we first imagine a single period, you know, world, um, so it's just a static model where workers have some productivity pie and they get utility from wages and working conditions. And there's some variable beta that kind of gives, you know, the relative um, weight that they put on working conditions compared to wages. Um, so we're thinking of, you know, firms can improve working conditions, but there's some cost P to that. And, um, you know, fitting with our empirical results, you know, we're thinking of this as kind of a factory level investment. So they have to kind of offer the same conditions to each worker in a factory. Um, then we're kind of, then we're saying, you know, suppose there's some workers that can observe working conditions upon beginning work and others that cannot. If anybody's kind of um, an IO person here, there's an analogy here to um, naive or myopic consumers and what's called the shrouded attributes literature. So when you buy a printer that, you know, you have to pay a million dollars to get, or a lot of money to get new ink every time, you know, IO thinks about, you know, or for our consumers kind of fully internalizing that. And, you know, kind of 
Um, if they're not, then they're naive or myopic. So we're thinking that, you know, kind of um, they, you know, they can observe working conditions and, you know, moreover, they're naive in the sense that they're not even, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, what might working conditions be. Um, so if they're competitive labor markets, um, in the paper we show that, you know, that the results don't depend on, to kind of illustrate the, the dynamics we want to illustrate here, you don't need there to be competitive labor markets. I think it's just kind of clearest if we do. So firms are giving workers their entire, entire marginal revenue product. So to uninformed workers, they're just, firms are going to bid up the wage to their entire productivity. Because as you're competing for those workers, as I mentioned, it's not just they can't observe conditions. They're not even making inferences that if wages are really high, it must mean that conditions are bad. They're kind of naive enough to just say, whoa, great wage. You know, this is the highest wage I can get. I'll take it. So they're just going to bid up the wage to the worker's entire productivity. That's what they're going to do to uninformed workers. To informed workers who kind of see the working conditions, the firm's just going to maximize the um, worker's utility, so kind of trade off, you know, between working conditions to maximize their utility, subject to the fact that they can spend on wages and the cost of improving working conditions, you know, the, the worker's exact productivity. Um, so uninformed workers in this world are going to end up in firms that have worse working conditions, but since wages are bid all the way up to the worker's marginal product, they actually pay higher wages. And again, it has to be kind of sufficiently naive. So the, you know, this kind of rules out the workers saying, well, my productivity is you know, X amount. If they're offering that all to me in wages, it must mean the working conditions are bad. So we're kind of ruling out that inference that they're making. So the working conditions can affect, can affect productivity? Um, no, we've, um, we've shut that down here. To kind of think about you know, what if we incorporated that, as long as the complementary is, I mean, if it's strong enough that all firms are going to say, we don't care if workers are naive, we're just going to kind of make that investment. But there could be some complementarity as long as some firms are going to kind of find it optimal to not make as high an investment as others. And we've just kind of assumed away from that. Yeah. Okay. So if we just add a second period where, you know, now all workers observe working conditions, what's going to happen? If there's some mobility cost uh, M, which kind of corresponds to the kind of qualitative evidence I gave to Jacob earlier that, you know, you have to take it off from work and look around. So let's say that's some cost M. Previously uninformed workers are going to be more likely to move and they're going to improve their conditions more than the workers that were already informed that had good conditions to begin with. Uh, so in the last two minutes, let me just kind of you know, say kind of in the, you know, um, how we're thinking about migrants versus locals, our story all along has been that they can be more likely to be uninformed than, um, than locals. But there are kind of other differences we've, you know, we've kind of been talking about throughout. They could have a higher relative tolerance for bad conditions. Um, and the beta was the measure on that. They could have lower productivity, um, you know, kind of for some of the reasons, you know, lower human capital that we've talked about. Uh, or they could have lower mobility costs. They're just not tied to an area, so it's easier for them to move. Um, so if we kind of think about a static model, both the fact that migrants are less informed and for differential, if they kind of just have a higher preference for wages, that can explain this initial sorting that migrants are in factories with worse conditions but higher wages. Um, Lower productivity could explain why they're worse conditions, but not why the migrants are in you know, factories that actually pay higher wages. Then if we add a second period and kind of say, you know, maybe there's a role for mobility cost, that can actually explain why migrants are kind of moving and moving towards better conditions, but it can't really, if that's the only difference between migrants and locals, it can't explain that initial sorting of kind of why all along were migrants in factories with uh, worse conditions but higher wages. Um, and then if we kind of think about a differential preference story, if that's time invariant, then it can't explain why kind of later on we see the migrants being more likely to move and change their conditions. Um, of course, we can't fully rule out a story of, you know, they, they have a time varying preference for wages. You know, they get less attached to their home village. They kind of care less about remittances. So that's where we kind of really need that, um, uh, that experimental variation that will be, you know, kind of, it, that's in the ongoing work. Because that's, yeah, I think that's kind of really the only fully satisfying way. Um, yes? Uh, in your sample, do you have groups of migrants that are from the same small rural areas that might know each other? Um, and that could be done in information. 
Yeah, I mean, and we kind of in the paper, we have a bit about kind of, you know, if you have a referral, you're kind of in a factory with better condition. Uh, so we have a little bit of that that we can kind of to bolster the information story a bit. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the problem is that they often tend to be related because we kind of sampled households where that kind of tend to have related people. So like they're all kind of related anyway. But um, would, you, would you know if, um, you know, in the areas where those migrants go, if they're already previous migrants from a while ago who have been there, like if, if that's kind of early. Yeah, if they're in the data, uh, yeah, and we can kind of check to do a little more with that because, you know, we kind of know home villages and so we can, we can see if that happens um, uh, in the data because we certainly would know if that kind of happened to happen. Because I agree, like that is more consistent with an information story, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, and then I'm aware that I'm out of time, I'll just conclude after this, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this whole, the, the preferences for weight history, to, it fits in this first period decision review, not the second period decision review. But I think that there, there's, I wonder if you're able to, in your data set at all, look at where these migrants land in terms of the distribution of potential wages. It seems that there's a big block of wages that are right at kind of that minimum wage. Mm -hmm. You said that there are some factories that are paying a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You might be in a situation in which, the migrants come and they, they seek out the factories that have the highest wages because they have that preference. And once they're there, it's not so much that, that the next change for to improve the amenities is revealing that their preferences are changing over time or that their preferences weren't what we thought them to be. It just is that they've maxed out on the wages that they can get working in this industry. So the only margin I would say to improve their, their, their livelihood is, is on the working condition side. I see, I see. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a, Right, and I guess that would fit like why aren't the migrants improving their wages? Yeah, or, or I guess yeah, we're kind of saying yeah. Wages yeah. For this industry in this location, and so from there, it makes sense that they would take other jobs and improve the conditions, even though they may still prefer additional money to working conditions. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to think about whether there's kind of some sort of test that involves the distribution to kind of think about that. Because I, I see your point, yeah, that like kind of a maxing out story. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll think about that. Yeah. Um, great. Well, let me just conclude. Um, uh, I've talked about this, um, the you know, just very briefly, you know, on the time varying, um, you know, um, preference for wages. We don't see migrants differentially improving their um, their assets with experience, kind of accumulating assets that kind of might suggest, you know, if they're kind of depleting assets that were, you know, kind of, or they're replenishing assets that were depleted in a move. But uh, I mean, these are not statistically different from each other, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not a kind of, um, you know, foolproof uh, test. Um, and so I'll just conclude. Um, so we told you that migrants are in firms with wor worse working conditions but higher wages. They move towards better conditions with experience. And then I sketched out in the end a model where migrants were less likely to be able to observe working conditions when they begin garment work. Uh, just to have you know 30 seconds on uh, policy lessons. So you know um, work, including some that I've done, has kind of argued that you know migration is you know kind of a good. Um, thing for policymakers to subsidize. I have some also work kind of, you know, that these manufacturing jobs are good for women in particular. Um, you know, none of this is to throw that away, but, you know, maybe even more so from a policy standpoint, if, you know, labor market imperfections like imperfect information are, are fixed. Um, and then, you know, kind of because we, you know, sketched out that model at the end with, you um, in a world of competitive labor markets, it suggests that you know even if there's a lot of competition between firms, that doesn't guarantee um, uh, efficient investment in working conditions. You know if there is this imperfect information. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. Thanks everybody. Uh, in the summary statistics, there is a mention of whether or not the respondent has a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Is there a breakdown of like whether or not it's just if it's a smartphone or 